Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. For the second half of today's program, we have Adam Thier, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, whose recent book titled Permissionless Innovation, The Continuous Case for Comprehensive Technological Freedom, has kicked off an interesting debate. Adam, welcome to the show. Hello, good to be here. Adam, lay out the landscape for us. There are two opposing principles right now that are vying to define the climate innovators operate under. One is called the precautionary principle. It's been ascendant in Europe. And the other is permissionless innovation, which is really the heritage of our country. Can you compare and contrast the two for us? Sure, Bill. The precautionary principle generally refers to the idea that new innovations should be in some way curtailed or disallowed until their developers can prove that they will not cause any harms to either individuals, groups, specific entities, cultural norms, business models, or other types of traditions. And these are any harms that any armchair analyst can come up with? Well, that's right. I mean, and that is a tricky question about how one defines harms. But generally speaking, those adhering to the precautionary principle mindset define harms extremely broadly. And it can be any number of pet peeves or other concerns that they might have. Mm -hmm. Permissionless innovation, by contrast, which, as you suggested, is really part of our uh, intellectual heritage here in the United States, is the notion that experimentation with new technologies and ways of doing things and new business models should generally be permitted by default. And that unless a compelling case can be made that a new invention will bring serious harm to society, innovation should generally be allowed to continue unabated. And if problems develop, then they can be addressed after the fact using a variety of other methods. And progress by trial and error is the human condition how do you make progress if you get rid of error? Well, that's exactly right. If we try to have trial without error, then by definition, we're never going to have any progress. Because only by making mistakes, only by experiencing uh, adversity and sometimes even accidents and some harms, do we as humans learn to cope and evolve and get better and find better ways of doing things. And that's the fundamental lesson that so many people of the precautionary principle mindset miss. They think they can envision every conceivable worst-case scenario or harm and preemptively address it when that's just not the case. Well, even before there's a revenue stream to pay for addressing the problems because you haven't shipped anything yet. Well, that's exactly right. You, you won't even have the product. You won't even have the innovation come about if you have a precautionary mindset uh, governing policy. Well, let's go back to the days of horse and buggy and try to make this come alive. Imagine that Henry Ford lived under the regulatory regime we live under today. What would happen to him before he shipped his first car if it were known that his invention would one day kill 30,000 Americans a year? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I think, obviously, there would be some more serious questions about should there be preemptive restrictions. I mean, automobiles are, in some ways, very unsafe uh, machines. They they do cause, as you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 33,000 plus deaths every year, and most of it attributable to human error. On the other hand, we also know that automobiles became a unique part of the American experience and part of our cultural and economic heritage and changed countless other sectors and many of them for the better. It did take a lot of adaptation. And the, probably the most unique thing about the way we adapted is that we even came to live with the fact that they were at times killing machines, that they cost us a lot of lives and a lot of economic costs. And so that's something that we've learned to cope with but you're right, Bill. I mean, if preemptively we would have tried to figure this all out, we probably wouldn't have first envisioned the kind of harms or issues that would mm -hmm. have come about. But then we would have probably come up with a whole variety of types of policies that ultimately would have made it so that the automobile would have had a hard time of getting out of its cradle at all and maybe never come to be the force it was in American society. So let's say we lived in the world of horse and buggies. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem with that is that, of course, if, if we're going to have that sort of static mindset where we freeze innovation in place and say, well, this is good enough for now or for us, and we've come to cope with this, so let's just leave things well enough alone. Well, by definition, you're missing out on the potential for progress and prosperity to happen at all. This is something that all great social scientists have identified as being at the heart of, uh, of what causes innovation, the ability to experiment and sometimes even, you know, break things or change norms and, and models and everything else. But it's also something more than that. It's about giving humans, giving people the freedom to experiment with new ways of doing things because, as F.I. Hayek once famously said, what matters is successfully striving for what each moment seems unattainable, for it is not in the fruits of past success, but in living for the future in which human intelligence proves itself. And I love that Hayek quote because it shows us that the way forward is really the path of freedom. 
And again, this has always been what's defined Americans and makes us different and kept us ahead of our competitor nations, if you view it that way. Europe has clearly gone in for the precautionary principle. I mean, Germany shutting down their nuclear power industry, very unfortunate timing now that they're paying all this money for Russian gas. Where does this lead them in the long run? Well, that's a great question, Bill. And I spent a lot of time talking about this in my book and doing some comparing and contrast between uh, this transatlantic clash of visions, if you will, between uh, the United States and uh, various European countries. And it's not just on environmental policy, but in the, in the primary focus of the book, modern information technology policy, we see a dramatic illustration of this sort of what economists would call natural experiment playing out on both sides of the Atlantic with regards to the Internet. Mm. Um, America's companies are household names across the globe. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Yahoo, all of these other companies, Apple. And, and you ask yourself, ask anybody, you know, can we name any European tech innovators <laughs> over the last no. decade. It's really, really hard. No. Policy had to have something to do with that. Let's go back to the early policy because I remember when commercial activity was illegal on the internet. I remember people like Ralph Nader and his minions fighting tooth and nail to keep commercial traffic off the internet, that it's something that should be academic and pristine. Take us back to those days. Yeah, that's right, Bill. I mean, back before the early 90s, the Internet was essentially a non-commercial platform that was mostly a closed club, if you will, reserved mm -hmm. for a handful of academics and technologists and engineers and assorted government bureaucrats. And if we would have just kept things well enough and left them there, we would have never had this amazing flowering of innovation and this cornucopia of information and entertainment choices we enjoy today. How did that happen? It happened because in the early 90s, we made a couple of key policy tweaks, starting with the commercial opening of the Internet, getting government out of the business of managing the Internet, mm -hmm. handing it over to a wide variety of commercial innovators and others, and allowing that sort of innovation to flourish from the bottom up. The other thing we did, we did not impose the old precautionary sort of approach to communications and media regulation mm -hmm. that we've applied to everybody else that came before the Internet. Essentially, the Internet was born free, and previous technologies were born in captivity. If you well, that was a historical accident. It's not something that was done consciously by the federal government. It's, in fact, something that came up from the bottom, and there was a, quite a guerrilla movement to make it happen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when you think about how the Internet uh, was, sort of was born free, I mean, part of it was just because there were so many mom-and-pop innovators out there doing so many innovative, interesting things that it was hard for our government to keep up. And basically, over time, they just stopped trying. And, uh, we know, it hasn't meant that there haven't been efforts to regulate the Internet or information technology since. But the reality is, is that unlike broadcast radio and television and cable and everything else, the government just couldn't get control of this new resource. And it's basically that innovation has flowered as a result. Take us through some of the techno panics that we've experienced. I, I certainly remember when nanotechnology first came on the news, there was a huge concern about the gray goo. Remember the gray goo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remind us about that. Well, there's arguments about nano, you know, self-replicating nanotechnologies that have pervaded a lot of interesting writing through the years. Bad robots. Just, yeah, and robot technologies. There's always some sort of Terminator scenario. There's been a, a variety of types of doomsday uh, uh, scenarios cast about about a variety of cyber technologies. You hear things about cyber war. Cyber and, Pearl uh, cyber Harbor. Yeah, and so I've written extensively about this and in the book as well about techno panics uh, and and talk about how. So often you see these sort of intense public, political, or academic backlashes to the rise of new technologies and a resulting sort of fear that animates policy. And what happens is you have hypothetical worst-case scenarios come to drive policy. And if there's a central lesson in my book, Bill, it's this. It's that if we spend all of our lives and all of our time worrying about hypothetical worst-case scenarios, and then basing public policy mm -hmm. upon those hypothetical worst-case scenarios, then by definition, best-case scenarios can never come about. Well, we get stasis. Yeah. The reason this comes about is sort of deep-seated psychological explanations for why humans are sort of risk-averse and sometimes risk-ignorant, not understanding, you know, legitimate risk trade-offs mm -hmm. or what is probably more risky than other things. And politicians and activists and others, they seize upon those fears. And they get people to think that these things are more dangerous than other things. And they, they use uh, various types of what I call threat inflation mm -hmm. to elevate risks that aren't as real. And this is ultimately what drives these techno panics. Let's look at Google Glass and connect the dots back for us to the original advent of public photography. 
and the fears that came about of, of total loss of privacy once the camera was invented? Yeah, that's a great question, Bill. I traced the, the history of a lot of these panics back to the rise of the camera because it, when the instant camera came about, uh, it led to uh, a little bit of an initial panic, if you will, but especially a panic among uh, intellectuals. And what was most interesting is that out of the rise of the instant camera came a very famous law review article, the most famous privacy-related law review article in American history. It was called The Right to Privacy. It was by Brandeis and Warren. Brandeis, who, of course, went on to become a famous Supreme Court justice. Well, and when was this? This was 1890, Harvard 1890. So when you say instant camera, you don't mean Polaroid. You mean something that amateurs could use. That's right. I'm sorry. I, I should have clarified that. And the point is, is that when these devices started spreading, a lot of intellectuals became frustrated because they said, wait a minute, it used to be I could walk down the sidewalk and I didn't have to worry about anybody snapping my image. That was my image, but mm -hmm. now somebody can take it from me. Or they could take pictures of some sort of event I'm hosting. Or in the case of Samuel Warren, the co-author with uh, Brandeis on this article, he was mad because people were taking pictures outside of his daughter's wedding. Mm. I mean, the audacity of it all, he said. And so he, th therefore, he believed we needed to have some new restrictions on this thing called the camera. And what happened? Well, what's so interesting about that, Bill, is that instead of this sort of backlash that led to uh, a whole body of law or bans on the camera, uh, Americans uh, had a very different answer to what they were going to do about the camera. They were going to buy one. <laughs> Everybody wanted one. And people lined up, and very quickly, having a camera, much like having a car, became a part of the American experience. Mm -hmm. And it's unthinkable now for us to think back and say, my God, how could we have lived without cameras, you know, documenting our lives and our family and our children? But there were people at the time who were wringing their hands about, what are we going to do? You know, what should our precautionary approach be? Again, trial and error took us in a different direction. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been problems with cameras. Mm -hmm. We have paparazzi. Right. We have people who take photos in gym locker rooms. We have people who do other bad things with cameras. But we have found other ways to approach and remedy those potential harms. Well, talk about those other ways, particularly in tort law. I mean, right. there's, there, there are ways to get remedy. If someone harms you, you sue them. So tort law is certainly one uh, sort of legal approach to this. I mean, that's certainly something I don't want to discount. But I like to start by talking about things like how education and empowerment and social norms can actually play an important hmm. role. You know, specifically, you think about the camera. And the fact is, we do have some laws for things like peeping Tom laws. I mean, you're not supposed to be in a locker room and taking a yep. picture of somebody. But when I go to my gym, that's not what's stopping people from taking photos of me in a state of undress. It's the fact that I'd be really, really angry if they did. <laughs> You'd be sore. There's a social expectation that <laughs> right. that's a private place for me. And there's a sign that my gym puts up, no camera phones, no phones in the locker room. Hmm. So there are social and, and organizational norms that develop around these things. And it takes time. I mean, look at how hard it's been. I'll give you another example. With movie cinemas, it's very annoying for people to be using their phone or texting during a movie. Well, now when you go into a movie, and I was just in one yesterday with my son, you're bombarded with ads beforehand by the cinema owners. Oh, saying, and people will shout you down. I've had that happen to me. I was in the theater yesterday, and someone was using their phone, and they got, they got hounded by the audience. Right. So you end up having the development of norms, and this norm-shaping hmm. process is really interesting to study. But regardless, they usually come about to try to control these things or, quote, unquote, regulate it in a different and bottom-up fashion. If you think about norms, the one that impresses me the most, people want to own a dog. And I grew up in the age where the entire public space was a dog's toilet. And everywhere you went, you were stepping on it. Mm -hmm. And the norms just seem to change. We solved that problem with dogs, not with a precautionary principle that prevented dog owners from owning a dog until someone solved the problem, but, but through social norms of people putting peer pressure on each other to clean up after their pets. Yep, that's exactly right. And we've seen that play out in other contexts as well. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not always perfect, right? There are always going to be mm -hmm. people who abuse uh, yep. you know, those sort of Still social norms, but there are people who abuse regular laws as well. The nice thing about social norms as an approach to some of these concerns about privacy and, and etiquette is that they evolve faster. Law is just a, a crude mechanism, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Larry Downs, the technology author, has this wonderful notion of the sort of law of disruption. He says the fundamental law of disruption of the information age is that technology evolves exponentially while policy evolves incrementally. Mm -hmm. And this disconnect between incremental policy innovation and exponential technological change is what ultimately is disrupting all of these various types of legal and regulatory norms and will require us to find a different toolbox to address these concerns that are raised about technology. Let's look at another case. I've been following commercial drones for some time. The precautionary principle seems to be ascendant right now, at least here in the United States. But before we get on to current drone policy, 
connect the dots back to the early days of aviation, there used to be a great concern about flying over someone's private property in a dangerous airplane because you could crash on them. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then eventually we had to change our, our ideas of what navigable airspace meant and what our property rights meant, right? Because obviously we could no longer own from the soil to the heavens if there were going to be commercial uh, aviation vehicles that could fly overhead, if we were going to have uh, navigable commercial airspace and make use of it for uh, commercial and travel purposes, things had to change. Both uh, social and legal norms had to change. doesn't mean we changed everything. I mean, we did still have some policies, and we still have uh, a lot of regulations that the FAA enforces today regarding navigable airspace. But the point is, is that we opened up the skies. We found a way to make this new innovation work it still is very disruptive in some ways. I remember my dear aunt and uncle who used to live just outside of O'Hare and mm -hmm. all the noise that they had to deal with day in and day out. But, you know, they adjusted to that as well. I mean, these things happen, and they're going to happen with drones. Drones are going to be a major innovation over the next uh, 10 years, delivering all sorts of things that today we expect to have to get in our cars to go get or have someone deliver to us but used for many other industrial applications as well, from agriculture to industrial things, environmental efforts. I think we're going to see more innovation flow out of that space than anybody can possibly imagine. It's hard to see how they're going to stop it. I mean, these things are getting so powerful and inexpensive. Even if they do want to stand athwart history and say stop, how are they going to do it? There's a challenge right now to FAA regulations of commercial drones on First Amendment grounds, because some people use these things to just gather information mm -hmm. or to engage in entertainment services, uh, film movies or mm -hmm. documentaries. If you are going to ban that sort of use, you have to answer the very legitimately difficult question in American law of what about my speech rights that have been, uh, have been restricted? And so I think on First Amendment grounds alone, regulation is going to fall and we're going to come to have some sort of basic, very simple rule that basically says, look, you cannot navigate below a certain level, air level, with these devices, or else that does pose some potential legitimate harm to people. But uh, above that, it's, it's going to be wide open. It's going to be a wide open space for innovation. One could imagine a corridors. Yeah, that's right. We're going to have corridors in the air, right? We're going to have uh, highways uh, in the air for, for these devices. And I think that'll be worked out over time. I mean, there's going to be a lot of wrangling with city governments about mm -hmm. that, as you can imagine. But hopefully they clear the way for it, and we have essentially rights of way in the air uh, for these things to get going. So, Adam, 3D printing has been in the news quite a bit. When they first came out, people got hysterical that users might be able to print plastic guns to go through airport security. There's a huge hue and a cry about intellectual property violations with 3D printers. What's the state of the art right now, and what's the state of policy? Well, the cost of 3D printers is falling rapidly, and their ability to replicate any number of different types of design blueprints is increasing exponentially. You are going to see within the next few years here, Bill, 3D printers fall to the point where they are as accessible to the masses as regular printers are today. When they are, and the materials to, to manufacture with them fall as well, you're going to see some really interesting types of innovations happening because when average Americans put their minds to it, they can do all sorts mm -hmm. of ingenious things. Now, in the process, it's going to create, as you suggested, some potential safety concerns or intellectual property concerns. We're already seeing that, as you suggested, with some of the manufacturer of firearms. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it could be any number of other things beyond that. Uh, I'm convinced, though, uh, it's going to be, again, very, very difficult to stop. We're going to have to come up with some very limited policies that basically glom onto existing policies. I mean, why should a 3D printing gun policy be any different than a regular gun policy, right? Now, we can let's ignore the debate about what mm -hmm. gun policy yeah. should be. The point is, why should they be any different? No matter how you get it or you make it, because my dad can manufacture guns in his own home. He, he can build guns and has for his whole life. Why should that be any different than if I printed mm -hmm. a 3D one, right? So we're going to have to come up with some sort of different, more uh, sensible policy for 3D printers in the long run because they're going to be coming at us very rapidly. Let's look at remedies after the fact. Google's been in the news lately because the European Union is now beginning to assert someone's right to be forgotten, right. to be able to go to Google and say, take that search result down because it bothers me, because it's, it's a scurrilous article, any number of reasons why someone might not take that down. How do you see that playing out? Well, I don't think it's going to play out well. Let me say this, however, that at least with regards to some of these technologies, and specifically some of these information technologies or network technologies, the way regulators are going to go out about it in the future is they're going to go after the biggest gatekeepers. They're going to go after the largest intermediaries yeah, the who potentially can sort of serve to teach everyone else a lesson – 
And in the case of search results in Europe, it's pretty easy for the Europeans to go after. Google has 94% market share, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be something that in the future, they're going to be the ones who are the primary police officer for online speech in Europe. That doesn't mean it's going to work. And it's going to be incredibly difficult to know how the Europeans enforce this. Uh, in the United States, of course, this could never fly because of our First Amendment. Mm-hmm. But in Europe, we wait and see how Google designs a tool to engage in that sort of historical censorship, if you will. One thing that nobody's paying attention to in that debate are the unattended consequences of forcing Google to do this because it ends up that they're going to be probably the only company that can afford to hire enough engineers and lawyers to actually try to administer that. And in a strange way, if they're Machiavellian about it and engage in regulatory capture, they can end up agreeing and say, no problem, we'll do it. And in fact, they already have. They, they said uh, within days of the announcement of the case, no they were going to try to design something for the German government to take a look at to see if it would be in compliance with the court order. And so there we go. We're off and running. Good luck to any small innovator yeah. trying to replicate that. Yeah. That's one way they can hold on to a monopoly. Yeah, exactly. Adam, there's a device out on the market called Narrative Clip that has a lot of people spooked. What, what is that? Narrative clip, as the name suggests, is something you can clip on to the lapel of your jacket or wear as a necklace. And it's a one inch by one inch little camera. And this little camera takes photos every 30 seconds, of your life, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. And at the end of the day... All day long. Yeah. It takes these pictures all day long, if you, if you set it so that it can take mm-hmm. them all day long. And then at the end of the day, it uploads them to the cloud and you've got a life log of everything that you've done and everyone you've interacted with. Needless to say, that's going to create some privacy concerns. Hmm. And some of those are very legitimate because if you're in a business meeting or if you're maybe just in an intimate setting with a friend or a partner and you are speaking about something that others are not aware is uh, supposed to be taped at that time, (laughs) then you might want to suggest, you know, new some new ground rules for this. And it raises the question, how do you create better norms if you're not fully aware of what's happening, right? So this could lead to some efforts to have some sort of regulation for at least transparency purposes of when you're wearing these wearable technologies that can be filming or surveilling other people's activities going to be very difficult to enforce those, but I think that's probably where policy is heading. I think the better approach here is for people just to be educated about appropriate use of such technologies, about, if you will, the proper etiquette of utilizing such technologies and where they're, uh, where they're sensible to be used and where they're not sensible to be used. Well, again, you're making the point that not all solutions are necessarily governmental. That's right. Again, in the book, I speak very, very broadly about the term regulate. I I talk about how we can regulate behavior without regulation and how, again, social norms and educational efforts and uh, sort of etiquette, these things are ultimately just as good at forming cultural habits and habits of the mind that get people to constrain themselves without having the calling in the proverbial cops to try to deal with these problems. Because ultimately, again, law is a very clunky, costly, time-consuming tool that often is way behind the curve. So, Adam, you've made an interesting case of how permissionless innovation and the precautionary principle are at odds. What happens if the precautionary principle wins and we surrender our right to permissionless innovation? Well, Bill, the point I I conclude my book on is that permissionless innovation is really synonymous with the case for human freedom more generally. And that if precautionary, principle-minded regulation and reasoning prevails, we're giving up a little bit of our human freedom, a little bit of our ability to go out there and try doing something differently and experimenting and just uh, finding a better way to build the proverbial mousetrap and to find the next great American uh, innovation. That's what's at stake here. And I think ultimately it has a lot to do not just with our freedom at an individual level, but our freedom as a culture, as a country, and our competitiveness globally. And so far, permissionless innovation has done wonders for America relative to the rest of the globe. We shouldn't give up on it easily now. Adam, you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. That wraps up our show for this week. You've been listening to Adam Thera from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Catch up with our past shows by downloading the podcast from realclearradio.org. See you next week.